All right, everybody, this is Ross. So in today's video, we are going to talk about my best fig varieties, the, the overall best varieties that I have that I've found for this particular climate. And we did a video uh, in, on a Fruit Talk episode recently about this very topic, but we didn't really narrow it down. I didn't really have a whole lot of time to really think about it, uh, but we have really narrowed it down to about eight varieties. So I'm going to give you my top eight. I can't even really go past eight at this point. There are some some runners up, obviously, um, and I'm going to give you guys the reasons why and talk about uh, really what makes sense for me here in this climate. And you know, whatever could be my best fig here in this climate might not be the best fig for you in your climate. But I'll tell you that if it's going to perform well here, it's probably going to perform well in almost every climate. Um, the real question with some of these figs is will they perform well in a really tropical place like Florida, Hawaii, um, or even just the tropics themselves? That's something that you're going to have to find out for yourself. And, and what we're going to do is I'm going to put out a series of videos over the next month, maybe the next few weeks. We're going to talk about similar a similar style to this. We'll talk about varieties that are perfect or the best for, let's say, California, varieties that are the best for Hawaii or Florida. Um, what are the overall best tasting varieties? Uh, we did do a video very recently on the varieties that taste the best here because uh, we actually did a blog post here, and we really broke this down on our blog, figboss.com. These are really the best varieties, and I really ex explain why even, th even things like Black Madeira why they do in fact taste so good and um, we break down but here's the caveat though is that we break down the varieties that perform well here because the problem is um, you can't necessarily I can't necessarily say that a variety like black Madeira let's take for example I may only get a handful of black Madeira that are really good and I know the potential of that fig right it's one of the best figs one of the best tasting figs you can grow. Um, so I know the potential. I know how good it is. But how consistent really is that? You know, if I'm only getting a handful of figs that are really good and the rest of them are kind of crap or even not edible, then to me it doesn't make sense. It's not really a fair little comparison, um, comparing all these different varieties and determining which is the best tasting. Now, it just so happens, fortunately for me, that usually the best tasting figs are also the ones that perform the best. And the reason for that is because in what we're going to talk about in this this video here is that they perform so well. And because they perform so well, they're able to put up with that moisture, the humidity, the rain. They don't split. They don't crack. They don't spoil. They usually have a higher bricks. And maybe they even have drying capabilities here. Even though we get 40 inches of rain annually, they're able to put up with that moisture. And because of that, because a fig really isn't a fruit that's supposed to be grown in a humid place. It really is supposed to be grown in a dry environment. That's where the fruit quality really thrives. But if you can find the certain genetics that I'm going to share with you guys with these different varieties, you're able to get an extremely high quality piece of fruit, even when grown in a climate like mine here in the Philadelphia area. So because it's so consistent, um, because the, they're so reliable, I should say, the varieties that I'm growing here are then also very tasty and also consistently tasty uh, because they're able to achieve that maximum ripeness that you like to eat them at. Uh, now, some people like to eat their figs very early, right? They like to pick them when they're not even really ripe, which, me, you know, sometimes I really roll my eyes that some people do that, but, you know, that's, every, that's your prerogative. That's everybody's thing, right? I personally like to get them as ripe as possible to the longer they hang on the tree, the more the flavor should develop, should become more complex. The sugars uh, should increase. The bricks could possibly increase. So, you know, why rob that uh, of yourself? You know, it's kind of like if I'm going to buy some store-bought figs, I can just pick them right off my own tree early, and I have a store-bought fig, you know, rather than a fig which is meant to be picked at the perfect time right off the tree. That's when you get the right flavors and the, the – um, the best quality so that's what we're, we're really focused on here is is the flavor but how consistent is the flavor right and of course the consistency of the flavor 
always translates to the performance of the variety. Again, things like split resistance, rain resistance, hang time, right? If it has a shorter hang time, it can hang on the tree for a shorter amount of time. That's then allowing it to avoid things like rain, critter damage, insect pressure, um, all kinds of things. Also, you have, like I said, the spoilage resistance. If it has a high bricks, it's probably less like, likely to spoil. And then if it has really good rain resistance, it usually has all those characteristics built into one. Um, so really quickly, a fig like Calamerna, as an example, has drying capabilities, right? Calamerna is the commercial dried fig. So all over in Turkey, California, this is what they do um, is use that variety. Now, if I were to grow Calamerna here, let's say I could do that. I had the fig wasp here. Would it dry on the tree for me here? Well, the answer is almost certainly no. And I've, I've never grown Calamerna, but what I can tell you is that there's different levels of drying capabilities. Some figs may only shrivel on the tree, and that's it. They turn into some sort of like maybe a gelatinous blob that almost never spoils, and they start to shrivel up on the tree, and it turns into something that I like to call as fig candy, which we can get to in, in a little bit. But other varieties will actually legitimately dry on the tree here. Like Even if it rains, I've tested it this year, I've tested it last year, there are specific varieties that just have such high a high degree of these drying capabilities. And what that usually means, what that usually correlates to, is that they don't crack, they don't split. The interior is not, therefore, exposed to the outside elements. If the interior is exposed, it's, you know, the, all that outside stuff is going to try to uh, spoil the inside, right? Also, because it has such a high sugar content, excuse me, guys, Therefore, the sugar content is then also helping fight. It's also help preserving the piece of fruit and helping to fight off things like mold and spoilage and, and fermentation and things like that. So, you know, usually if it's got those qualities to it, it's going to be above and beyond the rest. And therefore, it's also going to taste above and beyond the rest because you're going to be able to consistently have a higher quality fruit every single time you pick it. So... That's the brief little rundown here of all the different attributes and characteristics. Let's talk about number one. Number one is um, Verdino del Nord, and I've talked about this before. And you know, before I go into all these, when I really rank them out here, I really wanted to wait. Even though we did this on Fruit Talk, I did want to wait to actually make more of this information public because we are selling varieties on Figbid. And people, of course, always think the worst and would accuse me of trying to hype up these varieties for whatever reason. But we've we've sold the majority of the varieties. You know, there's very few varieties at this point that are for auction, uh, what have you. I mean, most of what I have taken off of my trees is already now gone um, and sold off to people. So I feel more comfortable at least, and you should feel more comfortable um you know, at least from my perspective, giving you guys my honest, true opinion here. Um, so Verdino del Nord is number one. I'll show you some photos of it. Um, it really is, first off, a very high tasting fig. And the reason for that is because of the drying capabilities. Again, it has the best drying capabilities I've ever seen other than Verdino, um, other than Neruciolo de Elba. And Neruciolo de Elba actually is number two. The both of these figs I've seen such a difference in quality cons you know, consistently compared to any other variety that I have to put them as a clear favorite above any other variety I grow. Um, and it really is because of those drying capabilities. I didn't think for years that it would be possible to dry a fig here on the tree, but it is. And even through rain this year, I've proven that through some of my videos. You guys can go back and look at those. Um, but, you know, it just has the perfect drying capability, Neruciolo de Elba, uh, dries on the tree. It starts to shrivel on the tree, excuse me, on day six, day six of the hang time. The hang time, very briefly, is just the amount of days that you would wait until you pick the variety off the tree. So as soon as it starts to swell, it starts to get larger and change color, that's day one. How many days after day one does it take for you to pick it at maximum or a ripeness that is comfortable for you and for me I pick it roughly at day six that's actually when it starts to dry on the tree 
I don't know exactly how many days that's going to take. I should count um, going forward. But it will actually dry on the tree here completely. Virgino del Nord is a very similar fig and takes about seven days for it to start shriveling here on the tree. Um, and then I would, I would guess roughly around the day 12, uh, maybe day 13 mark, it will be almost fully dry on the tree here, which is really, again, that's really incredible. Um, so therefore, as I've said, it's not like I like to eat dried figs more than I like to eat fresh figs. It's the fact that because of the drying capabilities, I'm able to eat that particular piece of fruit at the highest quality possible. This is like eating a fig from California. You know, I've eaten figs grown and caprified in California from varieties like this, these specialty. I've eaten the Black Madeira from California that was caprified. I've eaten um, Unknown Pastelier, which is one of the most intensely flavored figs you could think of. So it's not like I, uh, you know, don't know just how amazing these figs can be. Um, you know, it really does go to show you that some of these varieties, if you have the right genetics, even in a place like Philadelphia, you're going to have, you can achieve really, really high quality. And Neruccio de Elba, Verdino del Nord, they do that for me almost every single time. Now, the next spots I want to talk about, because that was one and two. The next spots, so three, four, um, five, and six are a bit iffy and a bit interchangeable, and I would almost just consider them to be on the same level playing field. And I don't necessarily know definitively if I could put one of them ahead of the others just yet because we're still, as every year goes by, we learn more and more about these varieties. We learn more about growing figs, and therefore – our opinions change, right? We're allowed to change our minds. So as we learn more next year, this whole entire list might be slightly different. Um, so historically, actually Smith was my best tasting fig. Before, um, not my best tasting fig, but the best overall fig I had. And here it is right here. And, and you know, before I had Verdino del Nord and Ruccio de Elba come around and really open my eyes to some of the characteristics that I should be looking for more than just something like Smith. Because Smith has just got some amazing split resistance, amazing rain resistance, humidity resistance, spoiling resistance. It just seems to really have adapted really well in the south, which is where it comes from, which is a very humid place. Over time, it has really gotten itself more accustomed to these more humid climates, and, and therefore, with the help of the right shape of the fig, um, you know, and all the other qualities, it even has some decent drying capabilities. It is definitely a very consistent fig in my yard, and therefore, that combined with the very high flavor that it possesses, you have to think, well, it's still up there, right? It's got to be still high on my list. It is very complex. It's slightly acidic. I love the texture. You can't really say enough about it. Um, it is also quite productive. If you get the, if you get the, um, uh, the light penetration right, so you have to really make sure you're opening up the branches, spreading out those branches to get light into the canopy. Now, Hatid de Argentil is one that really, really impressed me, and it keeps impressing me every year. I actually liked more of the Hatib de Argentiles a little bit earlier in the season versus when it got a bit cooler outside. They seem to be more, um, you know, they seem to have less nectar earlier in the season and had a you know, more consistent, dense, you know, elegant quality to them that you would find more in like a Smith. And then it seemed like as it got colder outside, the fig actually started to fill up with more nectar and actually had a more pronounced cherry flavor. And this is a fig that I think is actually more complex than Smith. And it does have a very distinct artificial cherry flavor. So if you're interested in these very complex varieties, this is definitely one of them. And I think it might be the most complex fig I grow. Um, maybe in a very close position with another fig I'm going to talk about called Rosalino in a minute. But... I'm not necessarily a huge fan of the cherry flavor, although it's interesting, it's different, it's unique, uh, it's obviously complex. People, A lot of people would really uh, love that flavor. But if the fig can can like perform the way it has more consistently earlier in the season than it did 
later in the season, I don't see actually a reason why it would actually surpass Smith because, believe it or not, it actually has, I think, better rain resistance and better split resistance. It's less finicky than Smith. Um, and, and, I, and also, I think it has even slightly better drying capabilities to it. It's really a phenomenal fig, and a lot of people just don't give it a whole lot of credit. It's very, very productive. It's very easy to grow once you get it established. That's kind of the main barrier with this particular variety. Now, the next variety I really, really like is actually Moro de Caneva. And again, these are for the third, fourth, and fifth, and sixth spots here. And they're all kind of right around each other. And I, again, I'm hard-pressed because Moro de Caneva is a fantastic fig. Um, it's not as complex as the other two, but the, the berry flavor is, is not as intense. However, it's really, really sweet. Um, it doesn't spoil. It has very good spoilage resistance. It doesn't split. In fact, I would consider this particular fig probably my third most reliable fig. So in terms of, if you thought about it just in terms of reliability, this would be number three. But the flavor, in a sense, is just bringing it down a little bit because I really like the flavor, let's say, more on Hatib de Argentile and Smith. However, the flavor is not like it's bad or anything. Um, it actually is incredible because what it does is it won't spoil on the tree. And it doesn't have really great drying capabilities, as I've been mentioning. The fig, instead, I like to call it, has shriveling capabilities, if that makes any sense. It's where it'll shrivel on the tree, and it'll kind of just form this weird thing where it, it doesn't spoil. It almost never spoils. I mean, the same thing could be said for Ron de Bordeaux and actually a fig called Rosalino, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, where they really just turn into this fig candy. They, they turn into this very strange i don't really know how to really describe it too well the the but i can tell you it's a different experience than eating something that's drying it's more like uh it's just a, it's just a slightly different experience and you could almost see even it, it just maybe it just needs more time for it to start getting those cork tints and really starting to dry but for the most part it seems like ron de bordeaux and moro de caneva maybe even well, not Rosalino, but definitely those two, they just seem to really uh, have so much moisture within them, so much nectar perhaps, that that might be sort of blocking them from drying. And instead they turn into like this candy. It's just, it really is super, super sweet. Very inc incredibly, incredible how good they taste. Um, it really is like eating a date at that point. It's kind of like, because it's very figgy at that point. Um, almost has date-like flavors to it, um, you know, kind of like a persimmon or a raisin as well, and they just really blow you away. And and I would argue if I could, if it matures better, if it keeps continuing to mature, which it will, and the flavor changes and it gets better, I'm gonna have no choice, I think, than to put this as my number three. Now the next fig is called Rosalina, which I don't have any photos of right in front of me here. Um, I actually, I can go on Figbit here and we can look at a photo of some that I sold. Um, cause I, I do have cuttings of this and this fig does a si very similar thing. Like I said, it turns into that fig candy and actually becomes very, very complex. Like Ronde Bordeaux is very complex on its, on its own, but it turns into that fig candy f state. It really gets more plum flavors. It's quite fruity. It's got dried fruit flavors to it. Um, you know, the, the the Reno or the Moro de Caneva is a little bit less in the berry intensity and the berry complexity, but it's got more of those dried fruit flavors to it, more of those uh, sugar fig type flavors to it. The Rosalino is extremely fruity. It is a fruity fig on its own even before it starts to dry. Now, Rosalino was a fig. It still is a fig that's used today as a fig that will dry on the tree and in Italy a lot of regions of Italy they specifically use them to dry so they will grow this variety and have them I don't know just they'll put them out on a table or some kind of uh, drying rack or something like that they'll dry them in the Sun or they'll dry them on the tree and they have them all winter I think there's a there's a special tradition with them with this particular variety in Italy of different regions I think somewhere in the Tuscany region of Italy that's kind of what they do with this fig and so you got to think well 
I already knew going into this fig that it's going to have good drying capabilities, and it certainly does. Um, I actually think the drying capabilities are right behind Elba and Verdino del Nord, but I don't know just yet to what extent that is. So if it really proves to me to be above and beyond what I had thought, then I have to put that one actually at third spot because it's going to have those drying capabilities and actually would put it above Moro de Caneva. So that's sort of my thinking there is that it does dry on the tree. In fact, the video that we did with it this year, we talked about how amazing that fig was. It's extremely complex, very fruity, very sweet. Um, this is a really underrated fig. And here's the thing that I had an issue with it early on. I almost didn't want to even acquire this variety because I thought years ago that it was a hardy Chicago type because it looks a lot like a hardy Chicago type. The figs themselves, the leaves, but when you really get a closer look, you really start growing it. You can, you can definitely tell that there is some distinct differences and I would not even put it under the hardy Chicago umbrella. If you really get close and personal with it, I don't think it even falls under that category. It's quite different. Although somehow in nature, you have a fig like Rosalino that's very close to something like Hardy Chicago. And I just think that's just very interesting. And maybe there's another another topic for another day. But, you know, Rosalino, that was my main gripe about it. And it, you know, the reason I'm telling you this is because actually the Hardy Chicago types are my, my seventh and eighth. Really, I'm going to put it as seven. I'm going to label them as seven because I have two varieties, Azores Dark, Malta Black. I love them both. They both have a different flavor, very different, actually. Azores Dark is really along the lines of a kind of like a strawberry jam combined with a fig jam. Here's actually what it looks like right here. Combined with a little bit of Concord Grape. It really has a very interesting flavor. It's got a high sugar content. It's got decent drying capabilities. It does well in the rain, obviously. It does well in the mo with moisture here. The same thing can be said for Malta Black, but it has a different flavor, and it actually tastes more along the lines of like a raspberry jam plus a fig jam. So it's quite interesting. I love the textures of them both. I love the sugar content. I love the reliability, the productivity. You can't go wrong with a hardy Chicago here in a humid place in a northern climate. They're as good as it gets. And they were right behind Smith as of last year. So to then think about how far they've kind of come down and what could be potentially replacing them, I actually do think, in a sense, Rosalino could replace the Hardy Chicago types, only in the sense that they are better in terms of their drying capabilities, and it's a significant better. I'm not talking about, you know, this is, this is on the level of, um, you know, Verdino del Nord, Neruccio de Elba, so... You really got to think about this in that sense and that this is not just your typical, you know, run of the mill fig that can sort of have decent drying capabilities. This is above and beyond what you would think. Whereas the hardy Chicago types are about slightly above average or above average. Uh, I would say above average in their drying capabilities. Not maybe not definitely not slightly above average. Um, so they're they're above and beyond that Rosalino fig. So if you think about these particularly, um, again you can't for, you you just can't forget about them. But here's the difference, right? If I'm gonna put Rosalino higher, it's because of the drying capabilities. But also because of those drying capabilities, it seems to taste well. Obviously, it tastes quite different. In all honesty, it tastes quite different than the Hardy Chicago types. But also, it's just better it, it tastes much better than the hardy chicago type so in my mind when i think about this fig i, I really do think that rosalino is a, essentially could be a replacement but it really does taste so different that it almost sort of isn't and i know we went off on that long thing there to kind of just get to that point but you kind of get an idea of now where i'm coming from is that it is sort of a replacement but it's sort of not because it's the same thing with Malta Black versus Azores Dark. Would I ever get rid of one of them? I don't know because they both really taste quite different, even though they fall under that hardy Chicago umbrella. Although Rosalino, I don't think, falls under that same umbrella, it's almost, in a sense, similar en enough that maybe you can make an argument that you could replace it.
I don't know. We're going to have to find out. I still have to learn more about Rosalino in the future. In the next year, I think we'll really have an idea of exactly where to place it. And of course, if you know we got through one through seven right now, if there's any redundancies at some point, of course we have to get rid of something, right? If let's say you know Smith is very similar to Hatib, then maybe I can get rid of one, right? Whichever one just ends up being better. So that would then, I guess, eliminate a redundancy. But I don't necessarily know that there is a redundancy here. Is kind of my point. The eighth fig and the final fig of the top eight is a fig called Campanieri. And I've been really, really impressed by this fig. Um, I don't necessarily have a photo. Let's go back to fig bid here. Campanieri has just blown me away um, in terms of the early class of figs. It's got a great flavor. And obviously, I knew going into growing it that it was going to be very hardy. It's going to have great rain resistance, great split resistance. It has a decent shape because it has a long stem as well. So overall, it sheds rain pretty well. And it's not like it's impervious to splitting, but it's very, very good with it. And then, of course, it has great drying capabilities. To what extent just yet? Not entirely sure. It's extremely sweet. I love the texture. I love the flavor. Um, for a very, very early fig, it's right up there almost with the Hardy Chicago types, with Rosalino, um, with Moro de Caneva. They're all really ripening around roughly the same time, give or take a week or two maybe a week and a half, two weeks at most. But for the most part, you'd have to think uh, Campanieri has got its place. It really does remind me, in a sense, of an earlier Smith. Um, so maybe at some point in the future, there could be a redundancy there. But I n haven't necessarily found the acidity in Campanieri that you can find, that little touch of complexity that there is in Smith. Um, so... There, there it is, guys. There's the video here on really my best overall fig trees. I've been growing them now for six or so years, probably about six or seven seasons now. We've been really obsessed with collecting these for a long time, acquiring them, trialing them, figuring out what would work here, and then actually very specifically going after very specific varieties over time. And I'm just happy to have found, I mean, I found nine, I found eight of them. You could say maybe nine of them um, that are really just quite exceptional. Um, and there's others that we've mentioned here. This is my best tasting figs. This is a, less, uh, a list you could look at of the best varieties I grow, not the best tasting figs, the top performing figs. You can find this spreadsheet down in the description of the video. You'll see all of these here um, in the spreadsheet. And this will be just an updated list of what I consider to be the toppest, the toppest tier, <laughs> the highest tiered figs I, I grow here. So there's some on here actually that we haven't even mentioned and that you could, I could make an argument that they're number nine, number 10, number 12, number 11, whatever. But I haven't necessarily wanted to go just that far just yet. I really love Bordeaux Greece. It's a must grow. Zafiro is the best tasting honey fig. Unfortunately, I killed my trees, so we still need to really evaluate that one a bit more before I can be more definitive about it. Aishia Black is uh, a fig we also need a bit more experience with, but across the board, it's got to be so, so good. It's obviously a big hit with everyone that grows it. Celeste is the same story. Uh, we have a number of Celeste types. Celeste is one of the best figs you can grow in a climate like mine. But there's so many different types. There's blue ones. There's gray ones. There's there's black ones. There's uh, there's brown Celestes. There's all kinds of strains of Celestes with all different colors and different flavors and really how they even perform differently. So personally, my favorites so far have been are going to be, I think, the black Celeste. I'm putting my money on that above all the others. Also putting my money on Stallion. And there's probably a couple other strains of Celeste that we really have to closely evaluate to get a good idea. The De La Roca and De La Senora Hivernenka, they have a special place, and they're going to be definitely in this discussion next year when we have more time um, and ability to evaluate them. And, of course, we have all kinds of runners-up, figs that I think are really exciting, have a lot of potential to certainly break into this little category here. I mean, this could be quite a different list in a sense next year, but... What I've mentioned to you in this video of that top eight is a pretty top eight that's set in stone. 
in terms of you can't go wrong. You're, you just are guaranteed to have high quality fruits. You put in the time, you really learn how to grow these figs well. You can get the same quality that I'm getting here in a humid climate. You guys can do that as well. So thank you guys for watching this one. Again, stay tuned with the following videos that are going to come. Um, the videos that I mentioned, like growing them in California, fig varieties for Hawaii and Florida, you know, all the different uh, video series things that we mentioned that are going to come over the next month. And if you made it this far, hit that subscribe button for me. I definitely appreciate it. We'll talk to everybody soon, all right? Take care, guys, and uh, we'll see you for the next one.